myself writing about social skills, socializing, mingling, uh, faux pas, how to handle that. I'm curious, how did that happen? Well, actually, it was quite accidental. I, years ago, many years ago, I was invited to a wedding with, my, with college friends. It was a, my first college friend who'd gotten married, and we all, it was like a big reunion. And at the end of the reception, we were all hanging out in someone's room, and everyone started, started saying to me, Jean, how in the world, I realized that I had, I had met the whole town of, it was in Dayton, Ohio, and I had met everyone at the whole wedding, and everyone else had said, you know, we just talked to each other, how did you do that? Like, and why did you do that? <laughs> and I suddenly realized that this was something that I love to do that people we either didn't want to do or were scared to do. And so one of my friends, Larry, said, you should write a book about this. And I wrote down all my techniques on a cocktail napkin. And that is how The Art of Mingling was born. So I'm curious, were you naturally, you know, like that? Like you, you naturally mingled, it came natural to you. So you had to like, you know, be very, you know, you had to think like, what exactly do I do? Well, yeah, exactly. I had to, it, it was, the thing was, is that it had, hadn't always come naturally to me. I think that when I was like, when I was 13 or so, I, I kind of was, I really loved, wanted to be popular, but kind of was a little bit insecure. So I, I sort of trained myself. I read this series of books <laughs> that were written about debutantes in the 1930s or something. And in the books, there were all these lines. And I mean, I think I probably did have a natural inclination to talk to strangers, but I did sort of consciously figure out how to do it from an early age. And then I forgot about it until this particular day in Ohio, and then I realized I really do have a system. You have a system. All right, so uh, your first book, The Art of Mingling, this was published back in the 90s, right? Yes, it was published, uh, my first book, and uh, it was published in 1992, and it was um, successful, so successful that I have done two major updates of it. Okay. The most recent being in just uh, 2015. Right, because a lot has changed in the, the world of mingling since 1992. Because... Yeah, I mean, people, the, the actual techniques and the how you mingle hasn't changed, but the, the world in which we mingle has changed, certainly. Right, and, uh, cell phones. And with all the technology and yeah. everything. We'll get into that. So let's get into specifics. Yeah. First off, like, how do you define, what is mingling? I define mingling as, well, literally mingling means mixing. And basically what I mean by mingling is interacting with a lot of people. I mean, not a lot of people as in more than two uh, at an event or a party. Um, often it's a room where you don't know anyone or an event, but it doesn't have to be. It just means that you are, you are it's more like a tasting menu rather than one dish. And it's not to say that at any time you can't switch into deep conversation mode, but the idea is that it's a place to, it's where you meet new people and and you know, you sort of, um, you're engaging in a different way because you're exposing yourself to new things. And like, what do you think the average time frame for like to be, it, for it to be considered mingling as opposed to like, I'm now engaged in deep conversation? Right. You know, it's, it's basically it's between like five and I would say five and 15 minutes, um, depending upon what kind of party it is and so on. Because I mean, and obviously if you meet the love of your life or your next boss, you can certainly step aside out of the mingling fray and, you know, have a one-on-one. -on -one. But it, in order to really get the most out of a party, you should really not talk to, you should, you can always come back. But like I say, after 10 or 15 minutes, you need to leave that person, go on to somebody else. Okay. And we'll talk here in a little bit, like how you do that. Cause I think that yeah. really throws a lot of people off. But I mean, one of the things that, that people or some people would say about mingling is that it's, you know, superficial and shallow and that, oh, you know, you should just get, to, you should just be real and get real to the hard stuff. What would you say to these folks as to why you need, they need to put that prejudice aside and really embrace mingling? Right. Well, a lot of people ask me this question, and I really think that behind this question is, um, is fear, but we can, that's another whole conversation. But uh, what I say to them is, there's two, thing, two main things I would answer this. It, one of them is, if you, I've had 10-minute conversations with strangers that have changed my whole perspective on a subject, or at least enhanced my day. And, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. That's the other thing. It's like, it's like travel or being an explorer. You know, you, you just, it's the unknown field. And so you, instead of thinking of it as a superficial conversation, um, you just have to, you think of it more as unknown travel, like social travel. And you never know when someone you meet, you, 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 
you either have a, uh, such a good laugh that, you know, that enhances your day, or you, you get a new, a new um, perspective on something that you wouldn't have otherwise if you hadn't talked to this stranger. And sometimes those strangers become acquaintances and then become friends. So, you know, the, it's definitely worth doing. You can't think of it as just that 10 minutes. It's what, how it creeps into the rest of your life. Right. Well, let's talk about the fear. So you say that that excuse is often given as because they're afraid. Why, why are people afraid of mingling? What are the biggest ones you think? Well, you know, that's the, one of the things I discovered when I first started writing that when I wrote the book and then right when it was about to come out, um, is that 90% of America has mingled, what I call mingle phobia. And I didn't even realize it when I, when I first, when I first wrote the book, you know, I thought it was going to be this tiny little thing that the publisher paid me no money and you know, a little bit of money, and it was just this kind of like little blip in my life. And the first thing that happened was I got on the Today Show with Katie Couric. And, that is when I, and then I got on everything. And that is when I realized that I had tapped into this very primal fear that I don't have. So, um, and what, what I discovered is that what most people are afraid of is being rejected, not knowing what to say, which is the same, really, um, and also there's another fear, which is about um, not knowing how to get out of a conversation. But that's secondary. The, but there are a lot of people who won't go to a party because they're afraid of getting stuck. But mostly it's about being judged, not having the, – the terror of being in a conversation and, uh, and having silence is absolutely um, a, a huge thing in most people's mind. Do you think the fear uh, is applicable to just people you don't know, or like do you have do people have that fear even with people they do know? I think mostly it's with people they don't know because that's what that's why I hear a lot of people say, "Well, I'm not going to know anybody anybody at that party, so I'm not going." That's certainly the bigger fear. I think people still have social fears when it comes to going to parties, and maybe they'll say the wrong thing. But mostly, I think it's about the people's fears about mingling, trying to talk to people that they don't know, because it's a you know, it's a totally unknown thing. Right, yeah. So um, right now it's like holidays. There's going to be a lot of parties. But there's people who are, they've got them on their calendar right now. And some people out there, they're like deathly afraid. They're like, oh my gosh, like I'm not going to know anybody at this thing. Like what are some like mind sh mindset shifts people can make or tactics they can use to kind of get over that initial fear so they can, you know, start interacting with people and start mingling? Right. I outline various techniques in the book. They... They're, I call them survival techniques, and they real, really are just to get your mindset changed. There's um, something that I offer up called the buddy system, which is where you pretend. Now, these might sound silly, but remember, they're just for your own trick of your brain. No one has to know you're doing this. One of them is called the buddy system, and that is where you enter into the room, you feel yourself freezing up, and you just pretend that your best friend or your wife or your mother or somebody who loves you, <laughs> maybe not your mother, I don't know, is standing right behind you, right over your right shoulder, going with you into the room. And, you know, like you just have to envision that they're there with you. And so if somebody doesn't say the right thing to you, whatever, you can just picture them saying, oh, well, that guy's a jerk or whatever. And then there's also another one that is helpful to do, which is called the invisible man. And that is where... The thing is, this is based on this truth that most people know intellectually, which is that people really aren't looking at you. They're only concerned about themselves. And so the invisible man is based on that, and that basically you pretend that no one can see you when you first enter the, the party. And that make, sort of lessens your self-consciousness until you're ready to become visible, which you should, should do fairly quickly, and, and actually talk to someone. You know, there's also just a faking it till you make it kind of thing, which I also talk about in The Art of Mingling. Yeah, that one, uh, I've used that one. Like, I imagine, like, if I go to, like, what would Cary Grant do, right? And, yeah, and, right. And, and the thing is, Cary Grant, like, he even said, like, he, I think there's a quote, he said, like, the, the greatest performance I ever did was being Cary Grant. Like, I don't think Cary Grant was naturally charismatic, but he had this idea that he wanted to be, and he put it on, and it, it worked. Right. I mean, that's the thing to remember is that people don't, cannot see your fear. And if you, the idea of fake it till you make it is that if you walk into a party and you smile and you pretend to be confident, um, this is why when your mother told you, just be yourself, that's wrong advice. <laughs> when you walk into a room and you are smiling, people will respond with smiling because people respond with positive 
behavior with positive behavior. And then once they do that, you actually will smile. So it's a way to trick yourself into it. I and mean, pretty soon it'll be real. So you don't have to fake it till the very, except for in the very beginning. All right. Let's say you've, you've done these sort of tricks to get you the, get, get over that fear. The hard part is like, how do you figure out you're in the party, you don't know anyone. How do you know like which person or group is receptive to you mingling with them? Because I think that's the thing that just you end up just having your hands in your pocket or holding the right. a drink and an odor of plays. What do you do? The first thing you do is you, which most people know, but you might forget. The first thing to do, especially if it's a big party, is you, after you've put your coat down or whatever, is to find your host or hostess and say hello. Now, because that's the person you know, right? So if your host or your hostess is standing with someone, they will, of course, introduce you. So now you already know this person or those people. Okay, that's number one. Then, now, then if you still, they run, wander away and you're all alone, you look around the room and you, you can, you look, when you want to approach a group, check out body language. You don't want to approach a group if you're nervous that is like standing with their arms around each other very tightly arranged. You want to go up to someone, one or two people or three who are sort of looking around and have more of an open feeling to their their, uh, you know, their bodies. Um, I call, this technique is called pla- practice your mingle on a wallflower. You can even find somebody who's alone who looks like they're lost too and go up and talk to them. You can, you can also use the food and the bar if you, it's never a good idea to, when I say use the bar, I don't mean like have 17 drinks before you talk to someone, but you can the food in the bar, people are gathered there to, for a purpose, which is to get a drink or get food, and you can talk to them about, you know, oh, it's crowded here, or have you tried the salmon, or, you know, you can use those things as kind of props to talk about. You know, have you tasted this, things like that. You know, then there's, there's a whole section in the book on opening techniques and opening lines as well. Yeah, we'll get into that here in a bit. I, one of the, the tactics I, I like, because I've done it myself and it's very effective, is like find a way to help the host or hostess like serve food. Yeah. Because that's it's yeah, easy. That's, yeah, that is a great thing to do. It, there's With the proviso that, I mean, it's great because you've got food in your hand and you can meet everyone at the party because they're all going to come up to you to get food and you say hello. However, you don't have hands free to shake and you pretty much have to keep moving around with the food. So you don't, it's even a quicker mingle than ordinarily. Like, in other words, you can't really get into a conversation while you're standing there with food. So there are some, it's not, I would, I would recommend more that you actually mingle by the food that you mingle with the food. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, you pass some food around and then put it down and then go mingle, that would be fine. But, like, it does kind of limit you because you can't actually drink, have a drink in your hand while you're passing the food. You know, so you, it sort of does put you in another you know, now you're a helper, and yes, you get to go around and talk to people, but you're very limited because you're, you're just offering food. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, gotcha. So uh, opening lines, right? That's like the first impression. Yeah. Everyone, everyone knows, oh, the first impression is the most important thing, and, and they put a lot of this pressure on them. they got to say just the right thing, and then they, <laughs> they're so self-conscious that they say something stupid. But, like, what are your typical go-tos for opening lines to start the meeting? Yeah, my, I identified, um, after years of research, I identified four basic opening maneuvers and that's in you know i also have a lot of opening lines in the book that are just that you don't have to maneuver you just use the opening line but the the best one of my favorite opening approaches is called the honest approach if you're at a party where you do not know anybody <clears throat> it's quite effective to just go up to a group of people stick out your hand and say hi i'm jean and i don't know a single soul at this party and it's a little bit scary at first, but when you, you it really works well because unless unless they're total idiots or jerks, um, uh, they will actually be nice to you and say, "Oh, well, this is so and so," and they'll introduce you and they'll ask you how you came about coming to the party, et cetera, and you're then you're on your way. It it's sort of like you're giving over your power to these people, and and it's and to make yourself vulnerable, people will usually be kind, and and also it's kind of refreshing in a way. If, you, if that doesn't appeal to people because it's a little too direct, there is the, the classic fade-in maneuver, which is when you kind of edge up to a group and, you know, you sort of listen to what they're saying, listen very hard, and when it's appropriate, you kind of, you just enter in, you, you say something that's relevant to the conversation as if you've been there all along. The, the trick with the fade-in is that you can't hang around the periphery too long 
lest you become a party ghost. <laughs> you don't want that to happen. You have to actually complete your fade in. And then another one of my favorites, which is you have to be a little careful with if you're a man, I think, these days, but it's called the flattery entree. And it's when you go up to someone and you say, excuse me for interrupting, but I have never seen such fabulous earrings. Now, of course, that's an easy one to do if you're a woman. But if you're a man, you can still go up to make, like another man and say, that's the wildest tie I've ever seen, or like that. You stay, stay above the chest when you're doing the felt flattery entree. Everyone likes flattery. And, you know, or you can even use, if, if you know something about the person, like you've heard that they're the one that brought the guacamole, you can go up and say, ha, excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but did you make this fabulous guacamole? That's another form of the flattery entree. And that people would respond warmly. Then there also, um, I have a whole list of opening lines that range from risk, risk free to daring. Daring ones are scarier, but they can often be more fun if you're, once you get into it. And that's all in the art of mingling. Yeah. The, uh, on the flattery one for guys, if you want to flatter a guy and not be weird about it, compliment the guy on his watch. Yes. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah. Cause every, cause there's always, what's great about it. Cause usually with the watch, first off it guys like that. Cause you know, probably spend a lot of money on it. So it reflects your style, but also there's usually a story behind it. Yeah. And so you can get them talking about the story. Oh, this was my grandfather's watch, blah, 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 blah. And it's great. Right. That's absolutely true. Watch is kind of like the male version of earrings for for women. That, I mean, sometimes women have watches too, but you're right. For a man, that's usually the, the thing that they wear that has something interesting about it. One warning I would have that a lot of people make the mistake in their opening line of asking people what they do for a living. That seems like a natural thing, you know, because it's, you want to figure out who the person is, you're asking them a question, but if it's an opening line, it's actually not recommended. And here's why. You don't know what subject you're bringing up, uh, when you ask somebody what they do for a living, it could be something, it could be they don't have a job, they've lost their job, they do something that's not something you don't want to talk about, and now you're into that conversation. But, but more than that, it's really kind of like, it comes off sounding like you're trying to figure out if that person's worth your time. To ask somebody right away what they do is kind of like, okay, who are you, how much money do you make, and do I want to talk to you? <laughs> And it's just, it's fine after you talk to them for a few minutes to then say, oh, so, and what do you do? That's perfectly normal, but just not as an opening line. We're going to take a quick break for your word from our sponsors. HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service that shops, plans, and delivers your favorite step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients so you can just cook, eat, and enjoy. With HelloFresh, all the ingredients are delivered right to your door in recyclable, insulated packaging and come pre-measured in handy labeled meal kits so you know which ingredients go with which recipe. And HelloFresh offers a wide variety of chef-curated recipes that change weekly, including the classic plan, which comes with a variety of meat, fish, and seasonal produce, veggie plan, vegetarian recipes, and plant-based proteins, and the family plan quick and easy meals the whole family will love better yet you can choose a delivery day that works best for your busy schedule even pause your account for weeks at a time my family loves HelloFresh. last night we had some delicious spaghetti ragu it was fantastic uh, they've just it just changes all the time what i love about it too allows us to introduce my kids to different foods they otherwise probably wouldn't have tried and they try it because it comes in the mail go figure if you'd like to try this at a discount got an offer for you get 30 dollars off your first week of HelloFresh by visiting hellofresh.com and enter promo code manliness30 again 30 dollars off your first week go to hello fresh.com promo code manliness30 check it out they've got a uh, juicy lucy burger coming up in one of their meal kits so you're not you're not gonna want to miss that juicy lucy's are really good 30 dollars off hello fresh manliness30 also by Saks underwear if your wife is asking you your girlfriend's asking like what can i get you for christmas and you don't have any answers ask her to get Saks underwear you, they might think it's boring but Saks underwear is not like all underwear they've got their patented ballpark pouch it does exactly what you think it does keeps everything nice and separate down there's so no more chafing no more sticking just super comfortable i like to wear them when i go rucking and especially when it's really really hot outside no discomfort at all walking for hours and hours at a time so if you want to try Saks underwear got a special offer and hey you can also tell your wife or girlfriend significant other that you can get you can save money buying my christmas present this year go to saxunderwear.com slash manliness you'll save 20 percent off your first purchase again that's sax underwear s-a-x-x underwear.com slash manliness to get 20 percent off your first purchase now back to the show now going back to the fade in approach how do you do it in a way where cause I, i'd be the way I, i'd be afraid with that is that i think i'd make my comment then everyone would think like who the heck is this guy <laughs> so, <laughs> so is that like is that a yeah. risk you take or do most people just don't care right or they just don't care most People don't care. Like that, that goes under the heading of everyone has minglephobia, and you're not the only one who's scared. And if you realize that every single person, even if they look confident, 
almost everyone is, has the same fears or has had the same fears as you. So most people are going to not be rude about it. If you if you end up making a you know a, a comment that doesn't go over, the probably the worst that happens is they just ignore it and keep going on, and it might be a little bit awkward. And then you can either stay there and you know try again, or if you're not interested or it doesn't work, you just fade out. You know, they do the fade out, you know, fade out escape. I don't, you know, the fade is not my first choice because of that. It is a little bit, but the thing about the fade is if you listen for oh, for a while and it, and the conversation doesn't seem like something that you can get into, you can you can abort. You don't actually have to complete the fade in and you go try with another group. So it appeals to some people for being, for like hedging your bets. Right. And one thing you talk about in the book, throughout the book, is that with mingling, so, I mean, one of the common bits of advice we're told when we're having conversation, we need to be present with that person, look them in the eye. But you also, with mingling, like you also have to be on the lookout for other stuff at the same time you're doing that. So how do you balance? Right. The, you know, the rule looking is... Looking for new opportunities. Yeah. Yes. Um, the rule is that you should, you oftentimes do have to look around the room because otherwise you never move. So the, but the rule is that you you... you when, when the other person is speaking, that is, you have to keep your eyes focused on their face. When you're talking, then you can actually let your eyes wander because sometimes, if, you know, that's a normal thing. You could be thinking, a lot of people's eyes wander when they're thinking about something and it's less rude. Obviously, you can't, you know, you have to keep coming back to the person so it's not really obvious that you're scoping out the room. But you can, while you're talking, look over, you know, quickly here and there to sort of see what's going on. But never while the other person is talking. Gotcha. Let's say you get the opening line and it went smoothly, but then the other thing people are afraid of, are afraid of is like, okay, how do I keep this thing going? Right. Right. Because you don't want it to. You get it. You, there's always that moment of awkward silence where you're like, right. well, okay. So what do you? What are your? What's your advice there? Um, well, just remember that the best mingling is is playful, and in, by that I mean that making observations often allows for more organic conversation than just keeping questions going so and also, also it helps you if you're lost you just like look around and, and try and focus on what's going on and and observe so saying something like I can't believe how grown up Julie's daughter has become might be um, like a better way to go than have you read the news today or what part of the city do you live in or I mean you could do that too but I found that the observations because then when you make an observation it allows people to respond with more creativity like that person could say yeah boy you could see, i have that happens with my children my children have grown up before i knew about it or you know like it can it just opens up stuff whereas if you ask people questions you can get staccato yes or no answers that, and then you're, you're just like no further along and it's also more more threatening so when you make an observation instead of asking a question it this allows people to relax more, I found. And you, as you mentioned in the book, the observation should be kept positive. You shouldn't, uh, most of the time, should be kept positive. Yeah, no, no, no bad gossip. No, no, um, isn't that a funny hat the hostess is wearing? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, unless it's meant to be funny, that's fine. But yes, no, you know, definitely positive, no, no gossip. And one of the things uh, in this updated version of the book, you talk about how, you know, most, you know, you're supposed to keep it light observations, talk about the weather, talk about what's going on in the party. But in, in you, as you highlight in the book, in today's political climate, like everything seems politicized. And right. an, an innocuous, you know, observation about, you know, my, oh, my health, I had to go to the doctor, that can turn into this heated debate about health care. How do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, even the weather, which used to be the safest conversation, you know, as quoted <laughs> in all Victorian books on conversation, you know, there, there were two safe, com safe topics the weather and your health were the things that they taught you as a polite person to talk about. And both of those lead right into politics now, so, or can. So I do have a section in the book on how to deal with that and um, ranging from trying to figure out, like when you enter the area, whether you can, there are some test questions that are kind of tricky that you can use to find out if someone's a fanatic. But mainly, you don't want to even go there. And, but if you fall into the conversation and you realize that you're about to have an argument or it's about to get tense, there are ways to diffuse and escape. Um, you either just change the subject or you can, you can actually just say, well, uh, you know, my mother always said I shouldn't talk to strangers, now I know why, or something like that. Um, no, that's, that's actually not. That would be only if they're, they're actually getting mad at you. But, the better line would be to say something like, um, 
well, I guess we can't solve the world's problems in one night. Shall we go? Let's go get a drink or how, let's go get some more food. You, know, some, you, you basically make a changing conversation line and then you move to another area. You know, or you can say, well, I guess we better either talk about something else or step outside. Try to make a joke about it. And if it doesn't work, then you just have to escape. Uh, you don't want to be, get into an ar- argument at, when you're at a party. I mean, my favorite one to do is just to say, suddenly if someone says, what do you mean? Do you believe in blah, blah, blah? I'll go, well, I don't know about that, but there's one thing I know about. I'm starving. Will you excuse me? And then you just go off to the food table. Sometimes you can get in, you know, you can have a conversation. It's not always the choice to escape. Sometimes, sometimes it can be, you know, interesting to have a conversation with someone who's on the other political side, but not if they're going to get angry. So there are, you have to read the book, but there are complicated ways that you can actually tell whether somebody is a fanatic or not. Gotcha. So let's talk about, so mingling is, as we said earlier, you're there for 10, 5, 15 minutes. Um, so that means you have to get out of these conversations at some point. And that, that's another fear I think people have. So the fear is like, okay, starting the conversation, keeping it going. Now, how do I end this without looking like a jerk? Right. Um, so what, what are your favorite tactics for ending mingling sessions so you can start another one? Right. Um, this is actually, it's a, such a big subject. I realized after I wrote, published the first edition that this was the main thing people wanted to talk about because everyone's really scared and doesn't know how to escape. So I have a whole chapter on escape, escape techniques. The most common one that everybody knows about, which I have dubbed, I have dubbed the buffet bye-bye and other handy excuses. And that, of course, is when you say, oh, excuse me, I, I really need to go get a drink or I'd like to, I need to get some food, etc. Now, of course, the problem with that one is that people, if you've really got someone who's glommed onto you, you they may follow you. And um, so the, one of those excuses, that the only one that really works is to say, I have to make a phone call. Even in today's age of, of uh, cell of smartphones, you know, everyone knows that if you're at a party, it's not, you can't just whip out your phone right there. So they know you have to go off by yourself. So that's a way, you, and then you actually have to go off and look like you're making a phone call for a second, then go to another group. But there are many other, uh, other uh, escape techniques that work. One of them, which is, seems to be most people's favorite, has a very cruel name. It's called the human sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> and in the, in the human sacrifice, what you do is you wait until someone you've met or you know is walking by close enough to you. You reach out and you kind of grab them. You introduce them to the person you have been talking to. And as soon as they are basically say hello to each other, there really is about a five-second period, five or ten seconds, when you can just leave. It's, this, it's based on the, 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 one of the uh, five laws of survival, which is change equals movement, movement equals change. Once that group shifts, like that conversation is broken, you basically, you've got to get out fast, but you can leave as soon as that other person. It's kind of like changing dance partners. You've given that person somebody else to dance with, now you can go. There's, there's also another one that's pretty common that I like to do is called... I like to talk about anyway, it's called the counterfeit search. Counterfeit search. And that is when you, you, you say, you, you find a, a pause, hopefully, to inter, interrupt, and you say, um, I'm so sorry, but someone just walked in the room that I'm supposed to talk to because my boss made me to, or my girlfriend said I had to, or some excuse like that. So it's like you have a mission, and you're so sorry, but you have to go. Gotcha. My, my favorite one was also similar to the opening. Like, just be honest with people. Say, hey, I'm here to mingle. It's great talking to you. Yes. I'm going to go mingle some more. Yes, and, that's, that's a good one. The honest approach in reverse. That's a really, that's actually is a very good one. All right. What do you do? Okay, you mentioned that someone gets, someone gloms on to you. This has happened to me. I went to a, like a, a cocktail hour and I was there to mingle, but I got stuck with this one person. And like, I would try different things, like, you know, sort of intuitively. <laughs> okay. Gonna, and it didn't work. Like they just followed me and followed. Me. Like, what do you do about like, how do you escape someone who's glommed on to you like that? Yeah. Well, that, that's when it, I think the human sacrifice is the only, the only thing to do. There's also, there's also something I, I think it's called the manager that I have in the, in the book. And that, that is when you actually take the person I need you to meet somebody. That's the, the stronger uh. version of the human sacrifice. And you walk them over to someone you know, 
And, I mean, all fair and love and mingling, the person, you might think, well, I can't do this to a friend, but, you know, if there's no other way to do it, you walk that person over to someone you know, you introduce them, and you, and usually, and you say, I know you're going to like, so-and-so has just been telling me about such and such. So you give them their first topic of conversation so that it'll stick, basically, and then you walk away. You know, that's, that's prob- probably the most you can do. All right. Sacrifices must be made. Yes. So... <laughs> so um, we mentioned you kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. So you let's say you you try to fade into a group, you try to you know enter you know enter into a group conversation, but like you're rejected. Uh, how do you handle that? Do you just move on and just cut your losses and not make a big deal about it? Yeah, if you can, basically, if you most of the time if you're rejected, it's not going to be in a very overt way, but in a subtle way, and you just have to take a deep breath. You know, maybe go back into one of the survival fantasies again, like your best friend is with you, and lick, lick your wounds. And remember that it's not, it's, you know, one person's garbage is another person's treasure. So it, it's not really personal. It Maybe that you're just not their cup of tea, so try not to, you know, all of a sudden say, oh, my God, everyone hates me. Um, but if you, if someone insults you, there are some lines in the book that from, you know, some might suit someone that not all these lines suit everyone. But I think, as I mentioned before, this is a line. My mother always talked me, told me not to talk to strangers. Now I know why is one of the ones you can say to people. If someone's just rude to you, like it might make you feel better to actually have a comeback like that rather than just skulk away or slink away. But if you make, if you make a bad faux pas and it's that kind of thing, then there are also other different kinds of recovery techniques for that. But if someone's, just rejecting you, you know, that's rare, really. People think that's going to happen, but it doesn't usually happen. Mostly it's just they don't talk to you or they, or they escape from you really quickly, and you just, you know, move on. Right. Don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. Everyone else, who knows what that person's got in their head. Maybe they've got some super goals for the party and you just don't fit them or whatever. What do you do about these situations at a party that... You get there, and you're like one of the first ones there. That's another fear. Oh, uh, yeah. That's why, why everyone shows up late to parties, an hour late. So how do you manage that if you're just, there's just a few people there, and everyone's kind of in their own corner and not just really keeping to themselves? And, of course, they're on their phone, you know, acting like they're doing yeah, something important. So how do you— That is a challenge. Because in the old days, we, the phones were not—and were not not uh, you could just easily corral those few people. So what happens if you're in that empty room situation, the best thing to do is to offer to help the host or the hostess. If they're, there's a, not anybody's there yet, the host is probably still running around, you know, doing things that you can offer to help. And then the only other thing to do is to go up, just go up to one of those people, pick the one that seems like the most. My father always had this thing where when he was, he had a thing that I call judging a book by its cover. And when in doubt, pick the person who's dressed most like you. <laughs> he was a musician, and he used to go to a party, and, and if he at a loss, he would look around and he'd find the one person who wasn't in a suit and tie, and he would go talk to that person, and it always worked for him because he was also not a suit and tie person because he was a musician. Um, so you just find somebody, who, and then you just have to interrupt them if they're on the phone and say, excuse me, hi, you know, uh, and just use one of the opening lines. But the... Uh, ha- Helping the host is, is, a, is always a good thing to do. I don't, you know, you can always get out your, in, all, if in that case, if every three people are there and they're all on the phones, you can get out your phone too. But I, that's, a, that's a last resort. I really recommend we've got to get rid of this. This is a bad thing. People should be talking to each other. So in the book, you also highlight that mingling isn't just for parties or social events. That You could do this throughout the day in public. And as you said, I think Americans have this, like a fear. They don't, we like to keep to ourselves. Yeah. So how do you overcome that fear, and how do you mingle in public without it being weird? Well, it's funny that, you know, in the, I'm a New Yorker, and this is one of the things that we, I think that is wonderful about being in New York, because we are not on our, in our cars. We are almost always on the street, in a bus, or in a subway. So it's a lot easier, because people are, but still, even in New York City, people are still uh, on their phones, and they think, they, they're around all these people, and again, the, the, I, I, fair, I encourage people to talk to strangers whenever possible and safe to do so, because you can have a conversation with a stranger on the subway, on the bus, in the shopping mall, you know, while waiting in line for something that really does make your day better. I mean, it's not, it doesn't happen every time, certainly, because not everybody is, you know, going to 
like everybody else, but um, just observation, again, is the key. When you're, as you're standing in line, you can talk about the line. You can ask how long you've been in line. You can start talking about the venue that you're waiting for. You know, when you're, you're on the bus, you can, you know, look out the window. You can observe what's going on on the bus. You know, you, you're on the subway. You see somebody who has the same um, theater program that you have. You ask, didn't you like the play? You know, there, you get it, once you get into the habit and you just look, all it really takes is being aware of your surroundings. And instead of looking and putting your phone away and just looking at people and being curious. And the, the rest kind of follows once you get in. It's kind of like a muscle. Once you start talking to people and you get good reactions and you, people smile at you and you have a nice little, nice little interlude in your day that you wouldn't have before, it like makes your day different. It's actually really can be wonderful. Let's say you've done some mingling, and you can do it just for its own sake. It's just, it's energizing in and of itself, right? But right. Uh, let's say you you meet somebody that this you're like this could be a, a a deeper relationship, a better connection. How do you do follow up with mingling? Because I'm sure l- when you're mingling, the people the person you think I want to follow up with them, they've mingled with lots of people, so they might not remember you. So how do you do it in a way where they remember like aha, yeah, I remember this conversation. Right. Well, first of all, not everybody has business cards these days, but if what I do is, as far as business, when you're at the party, when you've gotten to the end of your fascinating 15-minute conversation, I will hand them my card, and then hopefully they will offer me their card. But one of my tips is that it it's, um, may sound like old-fashioned etiquette, but don't ask for their card. and You, you should get, offer your card and let them offer theirs because it's a little bit too intrusive to ask for their card. I mean, in certain business situations, that's different, but if you're in the same industry, but in general. Now, so if you have their card when you get home, you can send them an email and remind them of something that you talked about if you had an interesting conversation. You know, always refer to something in the conversation so that they can remember who you are. If you don't have a card, you can find them on Facebook and direct message them. Usually it's pretty easy to do that, obviously, because you can find them through the hostess's friend list, probably, or if you, you remember their name, if you have their name, hopefully you can. But don't, don't immediately Facebook friend them until you've written them a message first and you have some response. After meeting somebody once for 15 minutes, I don't think it's appropriate to Facebook friend them. Now, again, people who are 20 years old may have a different rule. It depends on your circle, but that's what I say. And then, and again, always refer to something that you've, that you've talked about at the party and just say how nice it, nice it was to meet them, and you'd like to, you'd love to see them again, or you'd love to have coffee or something. And then let's see if they respond before actually proposing a date. That's sort of a, that allows the person the space to not respond, and it, it keeps you from feeling rejected if they don't want to. Do you know what I mean? So it's more like a great to meet you message than anything else. Yeah, I think it's good to put that caveat. It's like if you can, I'd love to. If not, no worries. Right. Um, you know, just like the pressure so, off. so, and also just focusing on how nice it is, how nice it, how nice it was to talk to them, and how much you enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Well, Jean, this has been a, a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about your work? People can go to my website, jeanmartinet.com, and you know, also my books are available on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. Fantastic. Well, Jean Martinet, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Brett. My guest here is Jean Martinet. She's the author of the book, The Art of Mingling.